Hello, my friends. Welcome back. So, I have another story for you today. It's called The Gnome, and it's from the European wonder tale tradition, part of our ancient folkloric heritage. Sometimes these stories are called fairy tales, but I think that's um, I think that's a bit of a misnomer and kind of gives the wrong impression because there's some very deep old medicine contained in these stories that reaches way back into our pre-Christian shamanic even past. The Brothers Grimm were two 19th century German folklorists and they did a fantastic job of gathering up all this uh, folklore from the oral tradition of our European ancestors which would have otherwise been lost right at the point just before industrialization while they were still uh, on the tongues of many 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 uh, simple folk. Having said that though they obviously kind of interpret it through their own 19th century lens which is obviously Christian and has various 19th century ethics uh, they probably view the tales as tales for simple folk or moralistic lessons for children, all of which is nonsense as far as I'm concerned, but that was their view of it, and a lot of that has carried on today. Uh, the other great perpetrators in this story is, of course, Disney, who have then picked up these grim fairy tales and put their own uh, moralistic lessons, some of which today might be viewed as quite toxic if they're sort of early, early 20th century Disney films. And even today, people are still retelling these fairy tales, trying to stuff their own contemporary socio-political points into these ancient wisdom tales which are so much deeper than that and I really feel we're doing them a disservice because what we have here in these stories is as I said earlier part of our really early shamanic heritage of Europe where these stories are used not just as entertainment or as simple science or as stories to scare children maybe some of that but not really these are medicine tales these are medicine tales that speak to us on a deeper level. Not, not here, but down here, the, 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 the level of the, of the soul, of the psyche, of the, of the deep mind, of the unconscious. Uh, and the imagery is the imagery of, of dream of the underworld, which is why this story is particularly pertinent to the concept of uh, the European wonder tale as a whole and myth telling. So this is a very important story and um, if while listening to this story any images seem to resonate with you then just sit with that for a while and have a think why that might be and do feel free to let me know in the comments and tell me about it because I'll be interested to know. And of course if you like this sort of content on myth and uh, magic and storytelling and uh, folklore in the oral tradition, then do please give me a like and a subscribe. It really helps my algorithms. And if you really like it and want to support me, you can always follow me on Patreon. Right, here goes. The Gnome. Long ago, long Long ago, in some deep, ancient tangle of time, which was somehow out of time, there was a king. Now this king was growing old. He had served his people well. He had been generous in his time. But his wife, you see, had died some years ago. And that king had become uh, bitter. He had begun to hoard. A little bit. Now, that king had a garden. That garden, I offer to you, is inside of all of us. And in the centre of that garden grew a beautiful apple tree. And the apples that grew on that tree were abundant and blood red. This, my friends, was the tree of life. Now, once upon a time, the king and the queen, when she was still alive, would sit beneath that apple tree and they would hand out the apples to anyone who came along, whether rich or poor. And because of that generosity of spirit, the land was plentiful and abundant. But these days, the king didn't like to give the apples away. In fact, he would like to count them every day. One apple, two apple, three apple, four apple. And sometimes he would polish them and he would say, they're my apples. In fact, 
he gave a decree. Now, in these days, when a king gives a decree, it has a kind of magic spell aspect to it. It was binding. He decreed that no one was to touch, no one was to eat one of his delicious red apples. They were all mine, he said. And if anyone, if anyone dared eat one of these apples, he or she would find themselves 100 fathoms underground. Now, <laughs> the king had three daughters. And one day, they were taking a walk through the king's garden. And they came across that apple tree. And they thought, oh, those apples look red and tasty. I'd like one of those. And the eldest daughter said, no. They are our father's apples and they are not to be touched. Then the second daughter, who was kind-hearted, said, oh, so we love our daddy and the apples make him so happy. It wouldn't be nice to touch his lovely, lovely apples. And then the third daughter said, mm, apple, mine. And she ate it up. Her two sisters looked at her, waiting for the earth to swallow her up. But it didn't. Nothing happened. Apple juice dribbling down her chin. She went, mm, mm, mm. it's delicious. She then plucked two more apples and handed them to her two sisters. There's a certain Christian myth resonating here. I'm sure you'll agree. There, the other two sisters saw that nothing happened when their younger sister ate an apple and thought, well, they are delicious. I don't know why father doesn't. <laughs> the earth opened up and swallowed up the king's three daughters. And sure enough, they found themselves a hundred fathoms underground. Now, later on that evening, the sun was going down, the king with his long silver beard was walking around his gardens, and it was supper time, you know, and he was like, girls, girls, hello, hello, it's dinner time, come in. They were nowhere to be found. The king searched and searched and searched, all the king's horses and all the king's men were looking all over the place, they couldn't find her. And then, with a slow, sickly, horrid realisation, the king realised exactly what had happened. And yes, it was his own fault. So, the next day, obviously, a proclamation was made. It's always the same, the usual terms. One of my daughter's hands in marriage, all the gold you can stuff in a sack, half the kingdom, all that. To anyone, anyone that can find my three daughters, said the king's minstrel. So, everyone went off, all sorts of adventurers and knights and uh, fortune seekers searched all over the kingdom, high and low. Now, it just so happened that on the very edge of the kingdom, the ragged edge of things, there were three hunters that lived on the edge of a deep, dark forest. A deep, dark forest where very few people feared to tread, except for these three hunters. And they were a little bit rough around the edges, these three. They lived at the edge of the kingdom, of course, the ragged edge of things. And, you know, they, they had a bit of a sort of country wit and simplicity to them. And they decided to search in the forest because no one had searched there. So they went by secret trackways and pathways and places only they knew until they came into a part of that forest where they saw something they had never seen before. Even though they had passed this way once or twice, it was a castle, a ruin of a great castle, all overgrown with ivy and trees. You know exactly the one. You've seen it in your dreams, probably. And they said to themselves, strange, we haven't seen this castle before. And you know, they, as you do, as you do if you're that kind of uh, slightly wild hunter type of young lad, the three of them went round the back of the place and, you know, peered in the windows. There was a fire burning. They could see fire lit and they could smell coming through the sort of, you know, windows. The smell of, was that venison cooking? Delicious smell. Well, as they did, they kind of scrambled up over a wall, as you do, space hacking, and uh, found their way inside that castle. Odd thing is, the castle was deserted, completely empty. There were no servants. And they walked through all the rooms and corridors, their feet just echoing. And they came to a great banqueting hall and kitchens, and there were chickens roasting on the spit. The table was laid 
with all sorts of wondrous things. There were cups of wine and mead, there were frosted glasses filled with beer, there were oysters, there were anything you like to eat. It was all laid out there perfectly. And they sat down and, you know, they might have been sort of sort of country folk, but they still, you know, they had their manners. So they sat down and waited for someone to, you know, tell them to go away or help themselves. But no one came. The minutes and hours ticked by and eventually they decided <laughs> to help themselves. So they did. <coughs> Just taking big bites of chicken, having, a, mm, I don't know, apple pie, pour, pouring the beer down their gullets. It was delicious. And then, it being late and their bellies being full, they sloped off to the upstairs rooms and laid their heads on silken pillows and went to sleep. Strange thing happened. While they slept, the very rooms of that castle seemed to uh, shift and rearrange themselves around those boys and their wishes desires and imagination. So when they came downstairs, things were just a little bit different. Maybe the fridge was a bit closer to the door so the elder brother could get his beer quicker. Maybe one of the lounges had like a, I don't know, an Xbox in it. Things like that, you know. It just sort of slightly, the castle molded itself to the, to the, to the wishes of the brothers. Now, next day, the brothers still found themselves in an empty, slightly changed uh, castle, and they didn't really want to give up the digs they'd found, would you? I wouldn't. So, they drew lots. Two brothers would go out and carry on searching the forest for the lost princesses, and the other brother would uh, guard the castle. They drew lots, and the lot fell to the oldest brother, who would stay behind, and the other two would go and search the forest. Now, it was about, I don't know, noon time. The elder brother was pottering around that big castle on his own, and suddenly there was a knock at the door. Strange, he thought, my brothers are back early. He went and opened it, and there, standing just the other side of the threshold, was a little bald brown man with black eyes. And he asked that older brother the age-old question, can I cross the threshold? May I come in? <laughs> Yeah, sure, why not, said the older brother. He stepped in. Can I have a piece of bread with butter on it, said the gnome. <laughs> the older brother said, sure, why not? Uh, went to the kitchen where there was still oodles of food, sawed up a little bit of bread, buttered it, handed it to that um, earth gnome. The gnome took it in his hand and then very deliberately, while looking that older brother in the eye, turned his hand like that and let it land on the ground, butter side down. <laughs> the gnome said, oopsie, I've dropped my bread. Will you pick it up for me? The elder brother thought this was a bit weird, but said, uh, yeah, yeah, sh sure, mate. Bent down to pick it up. While he was bending down, that gnome, that earth spirit, grabbed that older brother by the head, got a stick, and beat him, beat him, beat him, beat him over the head, black and blue, and said, idiot, 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 need him, and booted him uh, across the room, and then disappeared out the door with the bread giggling. <laughs> right. Next day, of course, fairy tale, rule of three, same thing happened again. The lot fell to the second brother. He was going to stay at home this time. The youngest brother and the eldest brother went out. The eldest brother, you need to know, didn't say any of this to his other two brothers. He was embarrassed, you know. He just put on a, a nice, like, hat to cover the bruises and, and didn't say anything. Exactly the same thing happens again. There's a knock on the door around noon. The door opens. There's a little brown earth God standing. He asks if he can cross the threshold. He does. He asks for a bit of bread. He's handed the bit of bread. He lets it drop to the floor. The second brother bends down to get it up and idiot, 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 boots it away. <laughs> Third day, same thing happens again, but this time it's the youngest brother. Now, the other two brothers don't really like the uh, youngest brother. Very common theme in a lot of these stories. Uh, and all three brothers, by the way, are inside of you. Remember that. So, youngest brother, pottering around the house. Um, you know, he's a bit, uh, he's a bit, um, he's a bit, he's a bit special. 
the, um, the, the youngest brother. In the Grimm's fairy tale, he's called Stupid Hands. But you know, um, he clearly has a little bit of nous because when that gnome appears at the threshold, he's invited in, he asks for the bit of bread, the bit of bread is handed to him. The gnome takes a bit of bread, drops it very purposefully on the floor, says, will he pick my bread up? The youngest brother says, piss off. Then he says this, bread is a matter of life and death. And if you cannot look after your own, do you expect me to do it for you? Then, he grabbed that gnome by the hair, got an even bigger stick, and beat him, beat him, beat him, beat him, beat him, beat him, beat him. And then the gnome said, stop, please, stop hitting me. I'll tell you where the king's daughters are. Sometimes things in fairy tales move very, 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 very quickly. <laughs> the youngest brother said, ooh, interesting. We've been looking for those three girls. Why don't you show me, little earth god? Not that he knew what he was at that stage. So that little gnome... <laughs> He went out of the uh, castle, said, follow me, follow me. He went round the back, uh, over a wall, into some raggle-taggle bit of ruin behind the castle, where there was a well. This is the archetypal well of your dreaming imagination. You've all seen one in your dreams. You know, the one, it's round, it's made of bricks, it's got kind of ivy growing up round it and down it. It's got sort of a bucket over it. The gnome says, look down there. And the youngest brother peers down and the chasm goes all the way down, 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 down into the dark. There's no water, just a line going all the way down, deep, deeper down. The gnome says, the king's daughters are down there. At the bottom of this well, there's a cavern, a huge cavern with a great dragon, with a many, 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 many coils and three heads. Those three heads are in the lap of the king's three daughters and they have to comb the dragon's hair and de-lice it constantly or the dragons will wake and swallow them up. You have to go down, slice off the dragon's heads and put the daughters in the bucket and winch them up. But do this yourself because I tell you this for free. Your two brothers are not to be trusted. Tell them nothing of this. Do not tell them what I've told you. Capish? All right, all right, all right, all right, said the younger brother. <clears throat> so, the gnome disappears, giggling off into the forest, down underground. The two younger brothers co come, up, come back. <laughs> and what does that younger brother do in his naivete? He spills the beans. He tells them everything. There was this gnome, this little brown, naked, bald man. And he came to the door. He asked for this bread and butter. And he dropped it. And then he said, can you pass me the bread? And I said, no. And I hit him over the stick. And then he told me where the king's daughters were. They're down the well, out the back. There's a bucket. We can go. We can kill the dragons. We can bring them back. We'll be rich. We'll get to marry one inch. It'll be great. The two brothers, they see with envy because uh, you know they had failed the gnome test have you ever failed the gnome test i failed the gnome test um and they plotted both inwardly ways to dispose of their brother but they hid it well so they went ah oh, good show us this well brother well done well done very very, very good so the three of them went to the well and they uh, drew lots once again to see who was going to go down into the underworld and release the three princesses the lot, again, fell to the eldest. And he was winched a little bit way down, but then he saw some cobwebs and a bit of muck and maybe a spider and said, no, pull me up, pull me up. Had a little bell on it. So they winched him back up and he kind of sprawled himself, gasping on the, on the cobbles of that ruined castle, going, oh, it's horrible, you don't understand. Next, the lot fell to the second eldest brother, and he went down a little further, to be fair, but then that shaft, that well, became, you know, very, very narrow, and he, too, lost his nerve and rang the bell and was winched up, and he, too, sprawled himself, went, I can't do it, I'm just claustrophobic, it's horrid. Finally, it was the turn of the younger brother. Stupid hands. <laughs> We've all got our own inner stupid hands. But he, he was winched all the way to the bottom. Dunk. And the floor of the cavern was dark. There was no light from above, but there was a glimmer of light through a little crack 
in the wall of that well and he crawled through and it opened up into a vast cavern that was kind of glowing from the scales of this huge dragon whose coils went all the way around the cavern wall and the three princesses were sat kind of among the coils on on chairs with consider this for an image with a dragon's head in their lap and they were just combing the hair and when that boy came in they went <laughs> okay <laughs> strong imagery you know that's tiptoeing backwards out of the room imagery there i don't know the last time you wandered into a cavern with a three-headed dragon um but then the youngest daughter quietly in a hushed whisper said there is a time to comb and a time to cut at that clue, the youngest brother took out his hunting knife and cut off the head of all three dragons. Ching, 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 quick as that. Those three princesses were suddenly released from their strange courtship, their dragon courtship, their captivity, and jumped up and hugged and kissed him all over and laughed and giggled and, I don't know, maybe they did a little dance, who knows. And then they said, you know, our father will repay you, yada, 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 yada. And uh, then uh, the younger brother put them one after the other in the bucket and rang the bell and they were winched up to safety. Imagine what the other two brothers thought when they saw these three beautiful princesses, one after the other, emerge out of that dark well. What treasure comes out of the underworld sometimes. <laughs> now, he was just about to get in the bucket himself when he remembered the words of the earth spirit, of the gnome. And he remembered that his two brothers were false brothers. They were not to be trusted. So instead, he got a stone, heavy stone, and put it in the bucket and rang the bell and saw it getting winched up, winched up, winched up, winched up. And then, sure enough, the older brothers cut the rope and that bucket thum, 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 fell. They, of course, thought their younger brother was dead, stupid hands. He was an idiot anyway. The three princesses protested, but those younger brothers with their hunting knives and also their strange forest magic put them under what the Irish might call a, a geish, an obligation, an oath. That their lips were to be sealed. They must never speak the truth or they would uh, be killed. Important things in those days, one's word. So the two younger brothers took the three princesses back to the castle and the king and all the courtiers were overjoyed. They were to get a portion of the kingdom each and marry the two princesses, two of them. I don't know what happened to the third. Um, meanwhile, down deep underground, that third youngest brother was morose. He was very, very low. The world was continuing above him. He could maybe see just some speck of light, maybe sometimes a bird would pass over. The passage of the sun and the seasons and the rain and the weather all taking place far, far above him, but he, deep down in the underworld, was completely alone. And he would pace around and he would see the dragon's head and he would say, well, you can't help me. He was obviously starting to lose his wits. And I don't know what he ate or drank. Maybe he just sucked on moss and ate worms. And he paced, crawled around that cavern for so long, so many weeks, months, that he wore the ground smooth. Eventually, one day, he was reaching into a crevice of a rock and his fingers just touched a flute. It's like Bilbo in The Hobbit, his hands just touching that ring down under the mountains when he needs it most. Similar moment to that, his hands touch a flute and he's just about to put it to his lips and play because he thought, I've been wandering around here for so long deep underground, I've never seen this flute. He's just about to play and then thinks, no, now is not the time for music. And he puts it back. Interesting moment. And he continues his pacing, 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 pacing. Finally, he's given up. 
he lets go. He lets go. He knows his time is up. He's ready to accept his death now. And he sits back with his back to the wall and puts his hands out. And there, again, his hands touch that flute. Well, if I'm going to die, he thinks, I'm going to die beautifully. And he plays a note. There, in the darkness of the wall next to him, appears in a bright greeny gold light a little earth god, a little gnome, just appears like a genie, just, just through the wall as if through glass. He plays another note, another one appears. He plays another note, he plays a whole tune and a whole battalion of little earth gods just appear in the darkness all around him like just little, ding, little self-organising machine gnomes. Just ding, 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 ding. He's playing this, this earth god tune, this song of the gnome and suddenly there's a whole host of glowing servants about him and they say, what can we do for you? And he says, get me the hell out of here and they all in the Grimm's version they all pick a single strand of his hair and they just whoo, they just float him up float him up like you might whoo, blow a kind of bubble or a or a dandelion seed up and they float him up 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 out of that well and deposit him back on solid ground and he goes back into that castle eats his food his hands are like long claws now his hair's all bedraggled and then he sleeps a long sleep and then he makes his way, quick as the wind, with the help of these sort of gnomes that are kind of carrying him aloft all the way to the king's castle. He bursts through the doors and a wedding celebration is just about to happen. It's his two brothers. They're just walking those two um, princesses down the aisle. And this wild man bursts in with, with uh, bedraggled and filthy and covered in mud and blah. And the king says, throw him into the dungeons. Of course, you know, why wouldn't you? The princesses recognise him. They recognise something in his eyes, and they say, "The wedding's off, father." Obviously, the two princes, the two um, the two hunters, are furious. The king doesn't understand. He's very angry, and they say, "What the hell?" He says, "What the hell are you doing, my my two daughters?" It's the eldest two daughters, and they say, um, "We're bound. We're sworn to silence. We cannot tell you." The king does something very wise. He says, so, tell it to the fire. <laughs> tell it to the stove, tell it to the fireplace, if you can't tell it to me. So the girls go and they speak the whole story of what happened to the fire. And it crackles and fizzes. They tell the story of the dragon being sucked underground, of the brothers of being sworn to secrecy, of the great lie of the courageous younger brother, and the fire fizzles and listens. Meanwhile, the king has removed himself outside and is stood at the door, listening at the threshold between one room and another in that liminal, in-between space where you can hear things. The king now knows the truth, goes down and opens the dungeon and sure enough that filthy young wild man has in his pocket, because the gnomes had told him to do this, three dragon's tongues as proof. If you ever slay a dragon, remember to keep its tongue. This is a folkloric message. So uh, the older brothers are thrown into the darkest dungeon where they still remain to this day and that younger brother is given a nice good shampoo and a shave and he scrubs up pretty good and he chooses to marry the youngest daughter because a strange courtship developed between them right from the very moment when she looked into his eyes and said there is a time to comb and a time to cut down 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 in the deep underground in the bowels of the earth so they were wed and the wedding celebration lasted. It's still lasting to this day because this myth takes place out of time. And if you put your ear to the ground, you can still hear them feasting. And my friend, that king, he became in his final years generous again. He started to hand out those apples. And my friends, I have to tell you, and I tell you truly, abundance returned to the land. The rivers were full of fish. The 
fields were full of grain, uh, the economy grew by 3.7%, everything was in abundance, great abundance. And that king was happy by handing out those apples. And the kingdom of wealth was saved by a impulsive girl from the centre and a wild boy from the edge of things coming together. So, my friends, that is the story of the gnome. Just a little fairy tale, isn't it? Just a, just a little story to entertain children. Well, my friends, thank you for listening. Uh, and as I said before this story, if there's, any, if there's any image that particularly resonates in that story, let me know in the comments. I'm interested to hear. And this story, all of these all of these old stories from the oral tradition that we so kind of flippantly call fairy tales, they are rich, rich in medicine. And they, I guess the important thing to remember is every element in this story, whether gnome or dragon or king or princess or hunter or castle, all of these elements are taking place inside of all of us all the time. And it's interesting to think that this story contains two dragons, both the both the, 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 the three-headed dragon and, you know, the king himself, who at the beginning is literally hoarding. And note, this is a very common theme in mythos. Uh, when the king, when there is a problem with, with, with the king, with our inner king at the centre, the whole kingdom ails. This, this is an idea from the pagan imagination. It's very, very, very old. James Fraser talks about this in The Golden Bough. Sometimes even there's evidence that if, if, if uh, the crop fails, sometimes the king would be sacrificed to the land to make the crop happen. Um, but interpreting that psychologically, if our inner king is, uh, is greedy or angry, our, 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 our kingdom, our, our experience of reality will also ail. Um, so that's something there. And also um, the lessons that can be drawn from the deep, deep underground and, uh, and what allies there might be under there, even in our darkest moments. I don't want to say too much about analysis of myth because I, I think that can be quite a dangerous thing to do because it can reduce it to less than the sum of its parts, if you know what I mean. You're all intelligent people. You can feel the imagery yourselves. Uh, let me know what you think. Finally, friends, uh, again, if you've got it, if you've made it this far, then do please give me a like and a subscribe. And if you want to support what I'm doing as a maintainer of the oral tradition, then you can always follow me on Patreon for as little as three dollars a month or pay a little more. And I'll send you a, um, a gift made of wood carved by either me or my partner's fair hands from this forest around me here. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you to my current Patreon members and I'll see you all next time. Thank you.